<clears throat> so it's our pleasure to have uh, Ruth Baker here from the University of Oxford, well, here in quotation marks, but uh, this is what we can do. Um, so Ruth um, did her um, degree and her PhD, or DPhil in, in Oxford, and completed a PhD in 2005 with uh, Santiago Schnell and Philip Maney, who some of you may have heard of. Um, and she then won a uh, RCUK fellowship and used that to spend time in Germany, the US and Australia. And she's now a professor of applied mathematics in Oxford and recently won a Royal Society Wolfson uh, Merit Award, which is a very high distinction in the UK. And the title for today is on the slide, Identifiability and uh, Inference in Cell Biology. The screen is yours, Ruth. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction and for the invitation. <laughs> it would be nice to be there in person, for sure. Um, so I'm more than happy as we go through this for people to, to ask questions. I'm not sure that I can see um, hands up, so just a shout out. Uh, and also, it's a talk of two halves. So again, um, we can always stop halfway through if that's useful. Okay, so um, I guess thought, I thought, first of all, that he'd give a short introduction to what we do in my group. Um, so we're really understand, interested in understanding how various different mechanisms contribute to drive collective cell maternity a lot of the time, and then how these processes combine with cell-cell adhesion, cell matrix adhesion, proliferation and death to give rise to very complicated biological processes. And we typically in the group focus on aspects of embryo development because I think it's incredibly important if we want to think about how to treat a disease or how to engineer a new tissue, then to understand how it was, um, you know, came about in the first place is, is incredibly important. But we all also have uh, projects in wound healing and in tumor growth. Um, and so I'm going to talk about two different projects in, in that space today. And increasingly, what I would say has changed about sort of developmental biology, um, most, most of the biological sciences, but in particular, I think developmental biology uh, over the past sort of 10, 15 years or so is the fact that we now really have access to quantitative data. So during my PhD, I think developmental biology was really a qualitative science where we were just uh, observing sort of phenomena from a qualitative perspective, and that was the level of comparison between model and, um, and observations. But increasingly now with quantitative data, our goal has in the group and, and sort of more generally become the interrogating these quantitative data using validated. So by that, I mean sort of calibrated and tested mathematical models. And so what I want to show Is that just me who lost the speaker or is? No, no same here. We lost her. Okay. Yeah, we lost her. Yes. Yes. Uh, hmm. uh, the question is, does she know that? Because <laughs> we can say something to her. Ruth, Ru Ru can you hear us? No. <laughs> I think she's out now. I think she's completely out, but the, the, she may not know that, right? Uh. <clears throat> uh, hmm. Well, she could now be sitting in her office talking to herself, right? That is a bit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. So I just sent her an email, but uh, she may, of course, not. Um, no, but she, if she is out of the Zoom, I think she would notice that. I guess. If she has the PowerPoint on her, yeah, call her, call her on the phone. Yeah, I was thinking that. Yeah, I yeah. will do that now. Yes, yes, yes. Um, okay, let me do. It. 
Hi, sorry everyone, I'm not quite uh -huh. sure what happened. Um, here we go. So I was talking about uh, essentially the fact that we um, want to make quantitative comparisons between models and data, and that's going to be very much the focus of this talk. Uh, the other thing is that we're in both of the examples going to take an interdisciplinary approach. So really combining experiments to, uh, conducted in wild type and perturbed scenarios with models via various means for data and analysis and model testing. Really thinking about this cycle where we have some predictions that we test essentially using the model uh, when our predictions or our, our, our model doesn't quite sit um, with our experimental observations, we want to refine those hypotheses and make new predictions that can be tested experimentally. So I'm going to keep going just so that we don't get too far behind time. Essentially, what do I think the challenges are of kind of trying to work in this quantitative framework? Um, I would say, first of all, uh, that we've got to think a little bit about what the right level of the model is for the data. So possibly, you know, when we were just making qualitative comparisons between models and data, that was a bit of a different question. Um, but I think now with quantitative data, we can ask questions um, relating to thinking about building a model at a sufficient level such that I can identify the parameters given the data. So by that, I mean, essentially, can I estimate the model parameters with some degree of confidence um, and, and measure their uncertain, our uncertainty in those estimates as well. Because I think what's very important is that allows us to go sort of, uh, sort of think about how uncertainty that we have in parameter estimates propagates forwards in, into uncertainty in model predictions. And again, if we're making quantitative comparisons, that's very important. Uh, so really what I want to do today is showcase how we uh, have gone about doing this with some quite simple models. So the biology isn't necessarily simple, but the mathematical models are about as simple as they probably could be for these kinds of systems. And more often than not, I'm going to think about the inverse problem, which is if I have some quantitative data, this is from a scratch wound healing assay, uh, and I essentially go from uh, essentially imaging uh, microscopy images to quantitative information, uh, can I estimate the model parameters? And within a Bayesian framework, I'm interested then in estimating the posterior distribution. So this is the probability of model parameters theta given data D, and I write that as the product as being proportional to the product of the likelihood of the data given the parameters theta and the prior distribution, where the prior just represents some uh, previous knowledge I might have about those parameter values. And I should say in most of the work today, um, we either have kind of very little knowledge or we don't want to, uh, uh, we, we want to be cautious about over constraining essentially our, um, our, parameter, our prior distribution or parameter space. So we take relatively un well, uninformed and wide priors. So the pro first project I wanted to talk about was a project joint with a collaborator, Elan Davis in Oxford, and that was relating to testing mechanisms of mRNA localization robustness. So the story really here is that essentially you make, the cell makes RNAs in the nucleus. It then essentially exports them through nuclear pore complexes into the cytoplasm. And then those mRNAs translate the proteins and it's the proteins that do the various jobs within the cell. So you can imagine um, that for very, very big cells that need to very precisely target proteins to the right place in the right time uh, in the cell, then essentially, instead of um, just you know exporting the mRNAs through the nuclear pore complexes and then transporting, uh, translating proteins anywhere in a cell, a sensible mechanism might be to actually put the put the mRNAs in the cell in the place in which you essentially want the proteins, because then they translate them in the place they're needed. And it, it turns out that this idea of post-transcriptional mRNA regulation is used by a lot of different cell types, um, used in establishing the body axis and cell migration and synaptic plasticity to kind of give you a few examples. And so the question we wanted to answer at quite a high level really is what controls this process of mRNA localization and what makes sure it's robust. So if a cell is gonna favor this mechanism over one, which essentially involves just translating a protein anywhere in the cell and then moving the protein, it should be, should be a robust process. So try and answer this question. 
we uh, worked in the framework of the Drosophila uh, egg chamber. So this is, a, if you like, a set of Drosophila egg production lines. So each one of these strings, I think there's sort of 18 to 20 uh, in, this, in this image here in total, each one of these strings essentially as you go up from the base towards the top is a, a sort of series of maturing Drosophila uh, egg chambers. And so right at the top are the, are the youngest ones, they're smaller, they're more immature, and as we go down in the direction they become increasingly mature. And we're going to focus on one of these in particular, and it's in fact the one at around this, well, at the 16 cell stage. So at the 16 cell stage, this is a cartoon of what a Drosophila egg chamber might look like. So in fact, out of those 16 cells, only one of the cells is going to become the oocyte, so actually going to form the, the, the drosophila at the end of the day. And the other 15 of those cells are what's called nurse cells, and they're essentially support or supporting cells. So they produce material that are uh, materials that are necessary for development of the oocyte. And what we know through a wide range of studies is that there's a number of mRNAs, so this one's Gherkin, Oscar, and this one's Bicoid, that are actually localized to specific places in the developing oocyte so that they can translate proteins to set up, for example, the body axis. So we know that. And what we know as well is that actually each one of these mRNAs is not in fact produced in the oocyte, but they're actually all produced in the nurse cells. And the idea is that somehow the, the mRNAs are transported from the nurse cells into the oocyte to where they need to be. How does that happen? Well, what I didn't tell you yet was that as this uh, egg chamber goes from a series of one, two, four, eight to 16 cells through this series of cell divisions, then the cell divisions are essentially sort of incomplete. So what you're left with after each division is a small bridge, which we call a ring canal that connects the cells. So effectively, it's a very small sort of tube that allows the passage of things like mRNAs uh, and proteins uh, between these different cells. So the idea is that essentially in this kind of stereotypical network diagram where this would be the oocyte, you're producing these mRNAs in lots of these distal nurse cells and then they're transported through this network into the oocyte. Okay, so this is a picture of what one looks like or an image of what one looks like in reality. So we're just staining effectively in green the cell boundaries. And so you can three, see these three nurse cells that are depicted here. In red, we've uh, highlighted the, the punctate spots of these gherkin mRNA molecules. And you can see that over here, which this, this cell here is the oocyte, lots of it is actually localized. And you can see just about here, there's a ring canal on its side. And if I go through a sort of Z stack of this, you can again see the oocyte, the ring canals, uh, sorry, the nurse cells, and there's a ring canal here, and there's one here as well. So you can see very, very clearly, there's another one that's popped up there, uh, that it's possible to collect quantitative data here by going through one of these dead stacks and counting essentially the number of these bright spots which correspond to these mRNAs, both in the nurse cells and in the oocyte. So that's the kind of data that we have hold of. Um, and what do we know from a very simplistic perspective that essentially these mRNAs are produced only in the maternal nurse cells and then they're transported, as I said before, to the oocyte through this network of ring canals. So if you could come up with the simplest possible model <laughs> ever of this process, then that's what we did. So we use a compartment based model where we're tracking the number of these complexes in each one of the 16 cells. And then we assume that there's bias transport of RNA between cells if they're connected by a ring canal and there's production in each nurse cell. So um, just to highlight as well that because the cell, sort of cell divisions are so stereotypical, you can, uh, this sort of network wiring diagram, if you like, that tells you how the cells are connected by ring canals is kind of reliably reproduced every single time. So we always label cell number one, that's the oocyte, and then uh, we have a very, um, there's a form formalism to label the rest of the nurse cells as well. So a system of 16 ODEs, is what the model looks like. It couldn't be simpler. We've got production at rate A everywhere apart from in the oocyte, so that's at zero in this vector V. And then you've got transport at rate B. And this matrix capital B encodes two things. And, it, and the structure of it does not, is not very important, but the idea really is just that um, it encodes the connectivity of this network. So essentially, uh, the ijth entry of B is only non-zero if I and cells I and J are connected by a ring canal. Uh, and nu is a parameter that represents how biased the transport is. Uh, and 
in the biology literature, uh, the convention is to have new to be biased away from the EU site, which is sort of counterintuitive to me because it all ends up going towards it. But just so you know, um, when you see the parameters, that's the case. So what can you do? Well, I guess the nice thing in this particular case is that the model is so simple that you can write down an analytic solution, which is quite helpful. And then you can uh, pick typical parameter values. And, and a lot, I guess a while ago, this is what we would have just done. We would have picked parameter values and then that would have allowed us to plot the distribution. So the stars basically should just be interpreted as the number of mRNA complexes in each one of these cells labeled according to this wiring diagram. <laughs> So we can do a bit better than that though now because we have quantitative information, what we can do is try and actually pin down these parameter values. So we're going to work, as I said, in a Bayesian framework. Uh, we're going to assume a measurement model, um, which is uh, to say that our observations are negative binomial distributed with some, uh, uh, some parameter sigma. And we're also going to introduce another parameter here, phi. Now, I didn't say this before, but actually what happens is that for these mRNAs to be transported between the various nurse cells, what, they're actually, what actually happens is that they're packaged up. So two or three of them are packaged up with a number of proteins and then they're transported uh, on, on the um, essentially the microtubule network of the cell. And what happens as uh, I just need to go back up one slide as as these sort of as these packages of mRNAs and proteins are are transported from any of the cells that neighbor the oocyte into the oocyte, so from two to one, nine to one, five to one, or three to one, then actually there's some higher order complex assembly process. So kind of these packages are further kind of amalgamated. And that's represented by this parameter phi. So it turns out that as soon as you introduce this parameter phi, the, the, the problem becomes non-identifiable, the model does, because Essentially, there's a trade off between this parameter phi and the, the production rate, I think. So what you need to do is to get around that by going and estimating this complex assembly uh, parameter uh, it, by independent means. So what we did was essentially uh, looked at uh, the intensity of these, uh, these spots that stain for these complexes in the nurse cells in the oocyte and in the background. And by comparing their um, by comparing their intensity, we get uh, essentially an estimate of this parameter phi being 0.4. So somewhere between two and three of those bright sort of spots that you see in the nurse cell are stitched together when you see them inside the, the oocyte. And we also can put a credible interval on that. And the idea is that then it allows this, this estimate allows us to specify a really strong prior for phi in the full model. And then that gets around those identifiability issues. So once you've done that, that's, uh, that's alleviated some issues, uh, and then you can go further towards getting the rest of the parameters. So now A, B, and U are the parameters that are interested in um, estimating. The first thing that you can do is essentially, um, you can uh, assume that you've got a quasi-steady distribution. So by which I mean that if you look at the solution at long times, it's all governed by this term over here. So the vector K2 essentially governs the relative distribution of these complex numbers across the different uh, cells in the system. So essentially what that allows you to do is to kind of forget about estimating the parameters A and B. And K2 essentially is all driven by this bias parameter or depends only on this bias parameter new. So again, by looking at these quasi-study distributions, you can estimate new by itself. So we assumed a relatively essentially flat prior from zero to 0 0.5. Uh, and what you, can, uh, what you can see is that the posterior distribution is really, really strongly peaked at quite low values of the transport bias. And again, to highlight that this, this in the convention that's used biologically means that essentially the bias is all towards, the, the transport is very strongly biased all towards the site through this network. From there, you can essentially, one of the things that you can do is do a posterior predictive check. So in the red, uh, we've got uh, data collected from lots of different um, sort of uh, egg chambers, all normalized so that one is essentially the level of mRNA in the oocyte. Um, and then uh, essentially the gray, uh, the gray shading just indicates the range of potential outcomes that are predicted by the model given this posterior distribution. And it seems to fit fairly well. Uh, you can go a bit further after that and just look at results in the, the full dynamic regime. And when you do that, you can get a handle on both the production parameter and the transport parameter, 
I think with a relatively good degree of confidence. And if you actually compare uh, essentially A to B times the, the average number of these complexes in the cell, they're of the same order of magnitude, which suggests essentially that uh, production and transport are relatively carefully balanced in the system to allow these, uh, these complexes to be localized. And again, you can go back and you can do a posterior predictive check. So this is a bit of a busy slide, but essentially what I want to draw your attention to is that everything is ordered kind of essentially from right to left. So on the right hand side, we've got cell number one, which is the oocyte. And then the next column across from the right essentially gives us what's going on in these cells that are one cell removed, right? So with a network distance of one from the oocyte. And then the next column essentially is everything that's a distance two. So a network distance of two would be here for cell 10 from the oocyte, and then three and four. And what you can see in all the cases, if the, the, the dots of the data and the gray shading is the essentially the predictions from the model, then uh, essentially the, our model encapsulates the data or predicts the data relatively well. So that's all well and good, uh, but in biology, I think you often learn the most when you kind of, you get, you get your predictions incorrect, right? Your predictions are incorrect because if your predictions are incorrect, it tells you some, that something about your, your hypotheses in your model are essentially incorrect. So although it's good that we've got to this stage, we wanted to go further and push the model a bit to see if we could essentially break it. So to do that, we looked at an overexpression mutant. So the idea is that each one of those nurse cells has one copy of the Gherkin gene in it. But we can engineer an overexpression mutant where the idea is that you put two copies of that Gherkin gene into every one of those nurse cells. So a kind of very simple and naive uh, model or assumption to make would be that you're essentially go um, from producing uh, mRNAs at rate A to in this overexpression mutant producing mRNAs at rate 2A, right? We just got twice the, twice the genes, copies. So the simple model extension is literally to stick a two in front of the A, uh, the production rates, and then to use the parameters that we uh, estimated from the wild type and see if this, this model can make sensible predictions about the rate of localization in this overexpression mutant. And so here's the kind of model predictions. And again, you can see that if you look in the U sites, we're doing really quite a good job, right? So in terms of the black line is the um, uh, is essentially the maximum maximum a posteriori estimate of the parameter value. And if we simulate the model with those parameter values, then it's really, really well predicting the data that we see. Again, if you look uh, kind of fairly close to the cells that are so sort of a distance one from the U site, we're doing a pretty, pretty good job. But if you look much further away from the site, so these cells that are really quite distant, like cell 15 or cell 16 or 13, you can see in here actually what the model is doing is massively under predicting the amount of, um, of these mRNAs that we're finding in those cells. So although it does a good job very close to the site, it's doing a pretty bad job in the making predictions far away. So this suggests to us that there's some kind of robustness in this process and that the, the system is regulating itself. You can see that kind of even further and more starkly if you look at the rate at which um, mRNA is accumulating in the oocyte. So in the wild type, this is the, the, the kind of the data, the data points corresponding to the wild type in this sort of blue green line. And what you can see is that if you look at the overexpression phenotype, which is in red, it's essentially not accumulating at any greater rate than the wild type. So despite the fact that what you're doing is pumping twice the amount of RNA into the system at, at any time, it's not accumulating in the oocyte any quicker. So there's definitely some kind of regulation process going on that's in, in essentially in endowing the system with robustness. So what could it be? So we went through a huge long list of thinking about different potential, you know, different potential mechanisms that could allow the system to essentially to, to be robust against this perturbation. So the first, uh, and we, we have a short list of three that we really considered. The first is sort of blocking of wing canals. So this is thinking about a scenario where essentially just like when pedestrians leave a stadium, okay, there's huge numbers of uh, individuals in the stadium and they're, they're leaving down these narrow channels and there becomes queuing, right? So they, they become queues arise essentially. So this blocking of ring canals just really relates to the fact that the, the, the system, the, the RNAs are having to queue to get through the ring canals. Uh, we can think about there being inhomogeneous production rates. So 
we're relatively sure that we're not getting two copies of the Gherkin gene into every cell, and maybe that's what's playing a role. It's a sort of simple explanation. Um, and the last thing is that maybe what we're seeing is some kind of density dependent transport effects. So if these um, mRNAs are essentially being transported on the microtubule network and you overload the network, then at some level, the, the, at some stage, the network's going to become saturated and you're going to reach a sort of maximum transport rate. And maybe that's also what we're seeing. So the idea was to essentially represent all these different hypotheses sort of individually and together as a collection of models and use model comparison approaches to evaluate which ones are the most plausible. So what you do is you end up with a series of seven different models where model zero was the very simple one I showed you where you just double the production rate of mRNAs. Model one just thinks that blocking or just includes blocking as a potential mechanism for robustness. Model two, density dependent transport, three production, and then the next three models combine, combine two of those features and the last one has all of them. And then we essentially, so by considering all combinations of these different mechanisms, we wanted to evaluate which sort of potential model was most plausible. And we did this under two different uh, ways, if you like, of weighting the models. The first one is a, a BMA weighting, which really strongly picks out model one, which is this idea of blocking at ring canals as being the, the factor that's allowing the system to be robust. And under the stacking weights, which are a bit more conservative in the sense that they allow for the possibility that the actual true model is not in the set of models you're considering, essentially and we're certainly the case. Uh, it still comes out in favor of blocking of the ring canals as being the kind of primary um, contributor, if you like, to robustness. Also picks out model five, which says, okay, not only have we got some blocking of the ring canals, but we've also got some inhomogeneity in the production rate of gherkin. Again, it's probably true because we probably haven't always got two copies of the gherkin gene in every cell. Is there evidence to support the fact that we can see blocking of ring canals? So we could go back and we could do some more on this and we probably should. But if you just take a look at some of the images we collected from the overexpression mutant, you really can begin to see areas around in, surrounding these ring canals where the uh, essentially these, these mRNA protein complexes are accumulating, which supports our hypothesis that essentially this crowding around the ring canals is what's allowing the system to be robust. So from this part of talk, a few conclusions. Firstly, I just want to get across the point that we have an incredibly simple model, but the fact that, that we can connect it to data um, in a quantitative way via Bayesian inference made it a very powerful means to distinguish between hypotheses. And this was certainly a case if we hadn't have, of, you know, sort of saying that if we hadn't have made a quantitative comparison, we couldn't have drawn these kinds of conclusions because all of those mechanisms would have uh, sort of done something that looked vaguely plausible. Um, and for this system, we, we think that our model has allowed us to sort of hypothesize that it is a tightly regulated balance between production and transport for localization. And that crowding of these complexes and blocking of the ring canals helps regulate the system and allow it to be robust. So that's the kind of first half of the talk. And I'm more than happy if anyone has any questions, I can't see hands uh, to take a few questions now, or if you prefer, I can answer them at the end. Yes. If anybody would like to ask a question, then they're welcome to do that. At this point, you just unmute yourself and ask. I think. But we can also do that at the end. If... Thank you, Ben. But then I guess continue. Thank you, ben. Continue, yeah. I guess. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to get rid of this thing on my screen now. Um, all right. So the second part of the talk, I wanted to. Um, Sorry, I can't get rid of the uh, bar at the top of the screen, probably doesn't matter. The second part of the talk, I'm going to switch tack quite a bit, but again, illustrates that um, sort of oftentimes when we're trying to un uncover biological mechanisms, then one of the kind of really useful things we can do is make a quantitative comparison between model and data to allow us to do that. And this is kind of moving up a scale. So thinking about how electric fields impact uh, the mobile or the motile behavior of single cells. So we know, and we have known for a long time that cells have you know, the ability to respond to a number of different types of clues uh, within their environment to undergo directed cell migration. So in the movie, what you're seeing is a population of cells undergoing uh, chemotaxis. So this is essentially motion 
uh, up chemical gradients, so usable, usually uh, diffusible chemical cues. But we also know that um, sort of haptotaxis, which is essentially motion up gradients in substrate bound chemicals or adhesion sites is, is widely used by cells. And also durotaxis, which is this idea essentially that cells can get guidance cues from uh, thinking or measuring the rigidity of the, um, of the environment or the extracellular matrix stiffness. But another cue that's not really all that much thought about, but maybe should be, I think, is electrotaxis. When so we were thinking about the direction, directed motion of cells due to an applied electric field. So what you're seeing here is two different sets of experiments, one from Daniel Cohen's lab and one from Min Zhao's lab, where what you can see is that very clearly, so in particular in the, on the left-hand side, we've got a field that goes left, right, and then up, uh, from down to up. And you can see this population of cells is responding collectively, essentially, to, uh, uh, um, to, to that cue. And why do I think this is important and interesting to think about? I think out, out of all the cues uh, that we can sort of, um, that the cells respond to, uh, Electrotaxis, kind of, or, or applying electric fields to populations of cells is maybe one that holds a, holds a huge amount of promise in terms of our ability to be able to control cell populations and to guide things like uh, tissue, you know, guide populations in the context of engineering new tissues or in terms of wound healing because it is just essentially so easy to control compared to all the rest. So our kind of very, very long-term goal, if you like, is to think about developing electrotaxis into a sort of bioengineering tool with, like I said, eventual uses in uh, regenerative medicine and wound healing. Sorry, my computer sounds like it's about to expire. Let's put it on book. Uh, and so our sort of path to, to, to get to that, 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 that point is to really kind of build on what's been done before in terms of thinking about the migration of, of cells and single cells and populations of cells in the absence of the field. So we know a huge amount, or we've, you know, there are a huge number of models out there for single cell motility without electric fields, and also for collectives uh, without electric fields. And in often um, many cases, there's a kind of direct link between one and the other in terms of model course graining. What we want to do for now is to think about how to adapt those models of single cell motility uh, in the absence of an electric field to include a, an electric field um, because that would then sort of together provide a stepping stone to think about how to understand the motion of cellular collectives in the presence of a field. And the idea is that once we have a forward model of that process, we can use that in some optimal control type frameworks to think about how to engineer electric fields to get cells to do precisely what essentially we want them to do. Um, but for the moment, we're going to stick up here. The, 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 the lower bits are kind of under, uh, under in progress at the moment. But we're going to stick at the level of single cells. So these are the kind of data that we've got in order to build the model. So the assay is using human corneal epithelial cells. Um, the experiments last five hours, and we're imaging every five minutes. And essentially, the data that we collect from these types of microscopy uh, images are essentially tracks uh, that tell us the location of cells over the duration of the movie. And I think in each one of these movies, we would track about 30 cells over time. So this is our kind of baseline uh, data where there's no field applied and the cells very much look like they're wandering randomly. And then we've got a second set of data that essentially uses an applied electric field. So for the first hour of that movie, there's no electric field. And then for two hours, it's to the right. And then for the subsequent two hours, it's from the left. And you can really see the cell population reverse. If I let it keep playing a second. So from the start, they're moving randomly. About now, the field's left, right. And then you can really see that when it turns from right to left, the cells all reorient. And again, what we're going to do in these movies is collect data by tracking approximately 30 cells over the five-hour time interval. So the first thing that we thought about was what was the appropriate, if you like, autonomous model. So what was the appropriate model for this cell population um, in the absence of an electric field? So we wrote down a model where essentially the position of a cell changes because it's got a velocity, no surprise. Um, and then we uh, think about modeling the cell velocity in terms of the, the cell speed V or the modal cell speed V and the polarity P. And it's essentially that cell polarity P that we're going to model. Um, uh, uh, or its evolution over time. 
So our model for the evolution of cell polarity is essentially a random walk with some drift or in some potential. Um, and that is motivated essentially by looking at some of the plots, um, eyeballing as much as anything of what the cells are doing over time. So in the top two plots, you can see uh, essentially histograms of the displacement distances of each of the cells we tracked over five minute time intervals. And so it's consistent with essentially cells generally being polarized Okay, traveling with positive speed and then transiently depolarizing. And the random walk aspect of the drift as, uh, diffusion aspect coming from the fact that the direction autocorrelation tends to drop off gradually over time. So that's our motivation for our evolution, our model of the evolution of cell polarity. Um, and then in terms of writing down a Potential W that describes the drift. What we do know is that cells spontaneously polarize, but when they spontaneously polarize in the absence of a field, their motion is unbiased. So this is a very simple, uh, essentially, um, potential that would describe that kind of behavior. So go back into our model. That's what it looks like. Um, we're going to essentially, I think this is highlighted, we've got three parameters, right? In the model, we've got this uh, parameter V, which represents the cell speed. We've got time scale parameter D, which relates to the polarization of our cells. And um, I'm going to reformulate it. Instead of think of the parameter beta, which is in the potential, think of a parameter delta W, which is the potential energy barrier. So essentially, D and delta W control uh, how often or the rate at which cells transiently depolarize. And you can see, you can very much see that in the movies that happens. OK, so these are the three parameters that we want to estimate in the first instance from our data. So when it came to thinking about how to calibrate the model to the data, we wanted again to take a Bayesian approach. So we're uh, sorry, in slightly inconsistent notation. This is a posterior distribution of parameters theta given data. So this is trajectory data in the absence of an electric field. And essentially, we're uh, going to write that as the product of the likelihood of each of the different trajectories multiplied by the prior. And again, we've got three parameters to estimate. So the likelihood in this model, as opposed to the previous model, where essentially you had an analytic solution to the model and we had uh, a noise model that, so we could just write down the likelihood. Here, the likelihood's intractable. And so the idea that we had really was to try and use synthetic Bayes to parameterize or to, to calibrate this model to the data. So what do we do? We define some summary statistics of the trajectory. So if we've got collected a number of trajectories, so a summary statistic might be um, the, the sort of total, if you like, trajectory length or the total X or total Y displacement of the cell over the course of the experiment. And then within synthetic Bayes, what you want to do is approximate the likelihood with the synthetic likelihood of the data um, and, and it's the summarized data, essentially under the assumption that it's Gaussian distributed. So when you do that, you can get posterior distributions uh, for your parameter values. And what I'm showing here on the diagonal are the, the posterior, uh, the marginal posterior. So this is the posterior for the cell speed, for the depolarization barrier and for the time scale constant. And on the, on the off diagonals, what I'm showing are the bivariate posteriors. And the important thing to notice really here is that like we cho chose, we had like, you know, zero clue for, for, for at least for D and Delta W in this particular model. So we choose incredibly wide um, priors for the, for the parameter values. And what you can see is that it, particularly in this case, right, that uh, the, the posterior mass is in a very concentrated in a very small region of that prior, uh, prior space. Um, and then we get really quite tight estimates on each one of the, the parameters in the model. So that's uh, pretty nice. Obviously, once you've got those posteriors, you can begin to make predictions about the model. So you can simulate the model forward in time using parameters drawn from the posterior and compare observed positions. Um, but you can also essentially make predictions on cell characteristics that you weren't actually able to estimate or to measure very easily from the data. So what's the average or the distribution of times to polarization or times to depolarized? And what's the probability at any time that a cell is in, in, in the system is polarized. So this kind of access by being able to make these forward predictions, you get to, to access some, some statistics that you couldn't actually measure very easily. So then the idea was to think about how to augment this model and how to sort of, or, or um, 
to think about mecha and, and to use that kind of, uh, if you like, so to sort of build upon this model to try and test uh, sort of different hypothesized mechanisms for how the electric field impacts the cell motility. So we've got an applied electric field, 200 millivolts, millivolts per millimeter in the positive dire X direction. So this is just represented here. And what we want to know, like I said, is how does this applied field impact cell motility? And this was our basic model. So what we did, kind of similar to the previous project, was to try and come up with a number of different sort of potential ways via which uh, the electric field could actually impact the cell velocity and uh, test each of them. So the first uh, sort of hypothesized mechanism, mechanism is that essentially what happens is that the electric field imparts an additional force on the cell and essentially what that does is essentially adds an additional component to the velocity that's in the direction of the electric field. And the strength of that, if you like, effect relative to the kind of autonomous uh, uh, sort of motile behavior of the cell is represented by parameter gamma one. Second, we said, well, maybe the effect of applying electric field can just be to make a cell move more quickly. So the idea is here that it doesn't matter sort of what direction of the field is in, it's just that you'll see an increase in the speed of a cell by a factor of gamma two relative to its baseline level. Uh, hypothesis three is that there's a speed alignment. So essentially the uh, extent to which the cell uh, velocity increase or is, increases or changes, if you like, um, due to the applied electric field depends on the angle between the field and the polarity of the cell itself. So this is just the unit vector and the direction of the cell polarity. And um, gamma three just represents the strength of that effect. And then the last uh, effect comes into the polarity equation. And it just says that we assume that the effect of the electric field is to bias the cell polarity in the direction of the field itself. So that's uh, just the term that pops up here in the SD for the cell polarity and with strength gamma four. So once again, our idea was to essentially look at all combinations of these different effects and trying to distinguish them or try and think about which model is best for the data. Uh, okay, yeah. So we want to look at all combinations of these. So I think we end up with 16 different models. Again, we want to calibrate the models to the data. Uh, the parameter space has increased quite a bit now because we've got up to seven parameters in our model. We've got these four gamma parameters that we have to include, but we've got additional data because we can still use the data in the absence of a field, as well as the data in the presence of the field in order to calibrate the model. Um, and I should say that when I talk about using the data with the applied electric field, we didn't use all of it because we wanted to keep some back for model testing. So what we did was we used the first three hours of that, that experiment uh, with the applied electric field. So an hour of no field, an hour of field from right to left. And then we're gonna keep the data, which is when the field direction is switched to try and uh, test the, the validity of our model um, after, after we've calibrated it. Okay, again, this is just to remind you what the data looks like. So we're just going to keep the data essentially up until about this point when the field is reversed and we'll use the reverse data to test the model. So I said we've got a collection of 16 different possible models, which are essentially all combinations of these different potential electrotactic effects. So each model is going to be uh, essentially indexed as uh, model X, which is some subset of one, two, three, and four being these different electrotactic effects. And we're going to evaluate the plausibility um, of the model to give rise to the data in terms of an objective function J, which essentially it relates to the probability of the model uh, X to, um, to uh, recapitulate the data X, both with and without an electric field. So on the next slide just here, all I'm showing you is essentially the subjective function J uh, evaluated over all different essentially possible combinations of these models. And what you see, and, and bigger J is better in this context, right? So what you see is that uh, when X is just four, so we only include that potential electrotactic effect X uh, four, then that's the essentially the model that is most consistent or best able to, to predict the data. What does that tell us? There's essentially strong support 
for a hypothesis that the bias that we see in cell motility is coming solely through the fact that cells want to preferentially polarize in the direction of the field. So we could have all of these potential electrotactic effects in there, but the one that essentially best explains the data is one that just has this electrotactic effect than before. And this is the model that you get as a result of that. Uh, again, you can then go away, you can look at the posterior distributions, check that there aren't any issues with identifiability. Uh, and certainly there aren't, right, if we seem to be, if we look at the marginal uh, posterior distributions, we seem to be doing a reasonably good job of pinning down those parameters. Um, and again, the, the posterior distributions, uh, if you like, are really, really, really concentrated in quite a small uh, region of the, the, prior, the prior space. So we're getting really quite fairly uh, precise estimates of these model parameters. Um, we can do, and I should have said this before, we can do all the usual kinds of posterior predictive checks, checking that our essentially our model predictions are consistent with the observed data, both in terms of the summary statistics. So these are the summary statistics that we used in the um, synthetic Bayes uh, algorithm to calibrate the model to data, and in terms of the actual tracks that we see themselves. Then you can ask the question about whether you can predict that the model can, with these parameter values, well predict the unseen data. So how, how, how is it going to do when we switch the direction of the electric field after 180 minutes? So the results here just show, and I think probably we'll focus over here, uh, what the observed trajectories look like. So if we uh, centered every cell trajectory on the origin, uh, and then uh, this is what the sort of set of cell trajectories would look like upon reversal of the electric field. And on the right hand side, we've got what the model, what the, what the model predicts. In terms of summary statistics, um, these are the summary statistics that, that we use to calibrate the model. I think we're doing a relatively good job. And we're searching, certainly in the model capturing the fact that the cells reorientate when the, when the um, field is reversed. But I'd argue that cells in the model are taking a lot longer to reverse than they do actually in the, in the experiment. So although we're doing an okay job, I think we've still got a bit of work to do there. Um, this is pretty much the last slide, but I guess the comment probably on this would be that one of the reasons I think we're not doing an incredibly good job is that we are calibrating the model to data using summary statistics, and they probably aren't sufficient to, to, to pin these parameters down quite, quite well enough. Also, that the kind of the model's got little information or the, the, there's no um, there's no data that relates to essentially the, the kind of process of cells reorientating versus the change in field. So it's not there. Um, and the other thing I was going to say, and if I jump back up a few slides to look at the data, is that our model essentially assumed that uh, we're, we're, we're working with single cells and single cell motility. So in other words, that there aren't any collisions between cells. But I think it's probably fair to say that at the point at which uh, especially the kind of field reverses. I think there are collisions between cells that may may essentially lead to them reorientating quicker um, than our model is going to predict. So it's probably a little bit to do with the actual data or the assumptions underlying the model and partly to do with the method that we use to calibrate the model to data. So some conclusions from this bit. Our modeling results predict that the bias we see in cell motility is coming solely through the fact that cells want to preferentially polarize in the direction of the field. Uh, I really like this approach essentially because we can very easily apply it to other scenarios and cell types. So one of the things I'd really like to do is to look at what happens over a range of different field strengths and begin to understand how these gamma parameters essentially depend on the, 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 the strength of the applied field. And I'd also like to look at different cell types. So it's certainly the case that some cell types go would move towards the anode and some towards the cathode, uh, right? So there's a huge range of differences in the cell types. And so I think it would be interesting to, to kind of explore that bit. And at the moment, we are extending these kinds of ideas to populations of cells with the ultimate aim being to, to be able to say, okay, you know, if in a particular tissue engineering application, I wanted to move cells along a particular path, um, how could I most accurately do that using uh, some input uh, electric field stimulation protocol? I and mean, then just to finish, hopefully what I've sort of highlighted today that is that if we really, I think, want to make the most of quantitative data, we need to think about calibrating models to the data. Um, and this, in both of these cases, has allowed us to really pin down the biological mechanisms that are important in driving system dynamics. And it's certainly, I think, 
the case that we couldn't have distinguished between these different hypotheses if it hadn't been for a quantitative comparison between models and data. Um, more generally, actually, I think, though, determining the right model is often difficult. And certainly for the first part of this talk, um, the model that I showed you that was incredibly simple and just a system of ODEs that we could solve analytically, right, that was that was not the first or the second or the third model that we Right. We have already. We have lost her, the speaker again, right? So, well, but let's wait if she reconnects. I... Yeah. Hmm. There we go. Sorry. Much was going on. Anyway, I'm pretty much finished. Um, and I think using a Bayesian approach to finish the uh, quantity in our parameter SR essentially equals. So just to finish with some some acknowledgements. So the mRNA localization work was on Jonathan Harrison. Uh, he's now a postdoc in Warwick. Uh, with Elon in Oxford, the electric taxes work with them. He was a book in my and he's doing institute, and it was joint when you should let you see. So, uh, the direction, and thanks for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, so I, I think, yeah, it's possible that we, yeah, ah, now, okay, so now we see the slide that, yeah, all right, okay. Um, right, so thank you for this uh, for your, for the talk. Um, so this is open for discussion or comments or questions. And um, as usual, I'll, I'll I invite the students in the audience to ask the first question if anybody would like to ask one. Um, just unmute yourself and, and ask. Okay, so no student wants to ask a question. Then any anybody else? would like to ask. Hi, I, I want to ask about the, um, there's a strong difference between the first and the second part. Well, there are many, many differences. One of them is that in the first case, the, the model is, is um, deterministic and in the second is stochastic. And I, I am, I was, uh, I was surprised, I mean, in the, in the first case, in the first model, in the first, uh, not model, in the first study, uh, in the, you, you, you show the, you were comparing the model with data, with trajectories in time, with the evolution of, of, uh, of um, the, the RNA in time. And here in the last one, you only consider summary statistics. Do, what will happen? I mean, my, my question is, my question in the first part will, would be, how can you accommodate uh, a stochastic model into, into, in, into your framework? And then you, you answer with the second, with the second part, because you, the, the model was, was, uh, was a stochastic. But I see that you don't, uh, you don't um, try to fit or you, do, you don't want, you don't try to, to use the, the information of the whole trajectories, only the of summary statistics. Is the uh, is possible? Will your your results become better if, the, if you if you use full trajectories in the second part? Well, I'm sorry, is, I'm really is, sorry. Is, I missed this, some of is, this, is this possible? Sorry. It's possible. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I missed some of the question because uh, the internet connection has been terrible. I'm really sorry. So, um, well, I think I, the, I can, the I can make here... it just shorter. The the yes, in the if instead of using summary statistics in the in, the, in your last case, you use uh, information on the full trajectories, is this feasible? Be it will be better. Um, I don't think it's feasible because I think the dimensionality of the data then becomes very high, and that's really a problem for the acceptance rates of the 
um, essentially of the of the algorithm. Um, so, but yeah, you're certainly right that we are losing information by using summary to statistics. And I can own up to the fact that we had a different data set for a while and different summary to statistics were better for that data set for whatever reason. Um, so I think there's certainly information that's lost through the use of summary statistics and that's certainly, certainly a big question. And um, yeah, we, put, we could do better for sure. I think we had to work quite hard with the synthetic Bayes algorithm as it was. Um, let me just see if I can share screen to be able to use it in this context anyway. So, uh, so essentially, I don't know if this is quite on the slide, but essentially we had to use a sort of sequential Monte Carlo type approach to synthetic likelihood where we, um, maybe I've got it better on the slide somewhere, I don't, maybe. Um, sorry, screen screen shot. Um, I think essentially we we had to use a sort of a, 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 we had to sort of use tempering so that we gradually increased the uh, the the temperature of that of that tempered distribution. Let me just press play again. Um, and and that was something that was necessarily essentially to deal with the fact that we had a huge prior distribution and uh, uh, a very narrow posterior, very, all well, the posterior was very focused within that. So by essentially changing the, the temperature parameter here that allowed us to get the synthetic likelihood scheme to work as it was. But yes, certainly we're missing information by using summary statistics, so that's a good question. Okay, good. Any other questions or comments? There we go. So I don't know. Anybody else? No? Well, if that's not the case, then thank you again, Rose, for this uh, yeah. for the talk. And um, well, it, it would have, as you said, it would have been nicer to have you here, but at the moment, I think it's uh, another time. Sa uh, yeah, exactly. Safer, uh, safer like this. Um, and I close with the, well, well, we'll see you, see everybody else next week, <laughs> hopefully. Um, Thanks, bye, bro. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 bye, -bye. bye, -bye.